So, here's the first lecture I give you an overview of what I will try to do. It. Last time in this short lecture, I gave you the cash price formula and uh, an indication of why it was important. So let's go back now to the using this cash price formula quickly for the case of this tensor PCA or spike tensor model that we're looking at. Of course, the idea is not that it can be used only for this case. Uh, if I have time, I will mention how this can be used for the same kind of approach can be used for other cases like uh, the perceptron or one layer thing. But uh, for the moment, I found this model because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not a model of deep learning at all. It's a model of statistics, but with the same kind of difficulties. So remember, we are looking at, the, at a, a tensor of rank 1, which is unknown, and which is observed in a noisy fashion. So you have a noise, a noisy tensor, a noisy P tensor, performing uh, rank 1 tensor. And so my notation where you have this tensor, this is the signal to noise ratio, V was the unknown tensor, unknown vector, and here you added a W, which was a Gaussian centered uh, E tensor. And the entries are IAD. Lambda was the signal to noise ratio, and V was, we had a here no prior, V was just a uh, or the prior was just a uniform measure on the sphere. And, and, and so I mentioned that what we will see is that we can study the complexity of this thing. There will be a, a threshold for it which will correspond to the IT threshold. And, um, and then there will be a weak recovery, uh, a strong recovery. And then, of course, the, at some point, if you have time, I will study the dynamics, which is the most important thing in short time. So, of course, when I say dynamics, we're, we're, what I was discussing was the maximum likelihood estimator, which is not necessarily, and in fact, it's not the best in terms of, a, of a signal to noise ratio. Okay, so once we do that, the function we were trying to look at was a function on the sphere, which I you know, showed last time. And this function on, on the sphere, when lambda was equal to zero, so writing the maximum likelihood I did last time, when lambda equals zero, this function is on the sphere current is simply the Hamiltonian of the p-spin spherical model. Right? So the function we're looking at, I, don't, I forgot how I called it, let's say, yeah, it was a <coughs> capital F, whatever, or H, you know, capital F of uh, X, where X is on the sphere. is simply the, with these W's here, so it's essentially the, uh, the P-spin model. There is a question of normalization again, because here I, I, I decided to start on the unit sphere, and as you know, on, in, uh, Physics normalization, the p-spin model is on the sphere of radius square root n, and the natural normalization is to take uh, uh, f of square root n, so let's let call it h of x, h of sigma, let's call it sigma if it's a spin configuration, will be with the negative sign that I can forget, 1 over n to the p minus 1 over 2, sum of j i1 i p, x i1, uh, sigma i1 i p, So that's the usual, and these guys are N01 IAD. So these are the two things, I mean, they are exactly the same things. These are also in, uh, independent and, and Gaussian and centered. So depending on how you normalize this, and then you get the same thing. So this is the usual normalization, the one I will use now so that you can match this <laughs> with, uh, with physics. Otherwise, there's always a problem in terms of uh, normalizing everything. So I'll take this one, which of course is the same. And the question we looked at last time, and, and this is an old result now, it's five years old, is to look at the, try to compute the, precisely the complexity of this thing. So I said, for instance, as a, as a first thing, compute the number, remember what, the, what that is. 
the number of critical point of this function of index k, index k meaning k negative eigenvalue for the Hessian, right? And let's say below the so when I write this, this will be this is maybe a new notation. This will be let, let me write it like this. This is the number of critical points of index k with value below the threshold n u. So why do I take an n here? I could put the n there, but it's because in fact, so look at this this function here. This is the energy. Its mean is zero. It's a random function, a smooth random function of many variable. In fact, the homogeneous polynomial of degree p chosen randomly. Its mean value is zero, and it's uh, it's uh, so the important thing, of course, I should write this. The, the thing that defined the model even better than this is the structure of the covariance of this Gaussian field. And this is just now with this normalization, it's n times uh, the overlap to the p. OK? That's exactly what I had written before without all these n's around. So in particular, this tells you that, so this is the important structure, as, as I mentioned last night. So the, uh, again, from a purely geometric point of view, uh, what this says, of course, is that this, uh, this Gaussian field, which is centered, of course, I should also write this, the expectation of h of sigma is 0. And this, this completely describes this Gaussian field, the mean and the covariance. So the covariance is just here. A function, forget the ends, it's a function, as I said last time, of the overlap, which means on the sphere that it's a function of the distance. So this is an isotropic field on the sphere. Okay? And that's the important thing. And as I mentioned, these isotropic fields have been classified a long time ago, uh, 80, uh, 80 years ago, in fact, way before physics looked at them uh, by Schoenberg. And essentially, they all. The, the mixed p spins, that is the mixtures of these things, are the only possibility <coughs> of, of such things. So, so, and the other thing now is, of course, take sigma prime to be sigma, then this thing here will be one. So the variance of this field is constant and it's n. All right. So. The fact that the variance is constant, as I said last time, says that in fact the, the field itself and its gradient will be independent. Easy. You can check easily that the fact that this covariance is uh, a function of the distance will impose that the, the gradient and the Hessian will be independent. So the only dependence that's left in the Cassius formula that I gave last time is between the, the, the function, H, and its Hessian. These two are not independent. Okay? Moreover, now, so I said the variance is n. So that means that in particular, so the typical fluctuation of this field are square root m. The mean is zero, the typical fluctuation are square root m. And it's and it we will see and it's known that in fact the extreme values, the minimum, the ground state, if you want, or the maximum, are of order m. <coughs> so the typical thing, the typical values are fluctuations are square root n. The extreme values are n, okay, negative n and positive n. So that's why I put an n here. Okay, by putting an n here, I'm looking at very deep values. Okay, I would take u to be negative here. All right? So, so this is this thing, and we want to understand this guy. Right. So that's why formula gave us a formula for this. Or we would like to understand maybe the second moment of that. And I didn't give the formula, but it exists too. So first, so remember when we did that, we have, so it's, it's, this computation is very simple because <coughs> the field is isotropic, as we said. So the only thing you have to compute in the end is the expectation, and remember, of the determinant of the Hessian of this function, and put x in the sphere. So indicator of the fact that the index is k, conditioned by the gradient, by the fact that the point is critical, and maybe by the fact that the, the value of x is whatever, v, v being a number. Okay. That's the core of the formula. The rest of the formula, you have to integrate this on the sphere against 
the density of uh, this vector, uh, that's, that's a trivial thing because in fact in this case the integral of the function on the sphere is constant. So integrating in on the sphere is not hard. All right, so the only thing you really have to compute for cat's price is this. And I told you that's an easy computation, that the distribution of this guy, conditioned by the fact that it's critical, which in fact you don't need to, to do, as I said, because these two guys are in fact independent, and by the fact that h of x is v, the distribution of this is in fact the GOE, of course, of size n minus 1 here, because the, you know, the, the Hessian is an uh, n minus 1 dimensional. Oh, maybe I'm too low here. I see some next. Uh, all right. Uh, minus a constant, which depends on p, times v times the identity. So that's the important fact. That's easy to check. So the Hessian is, in fact, simply, uh, of course, you have to understand what the Hessian means on the sphere, but I'm sure you can figure that out. It's simply a GOE shifted by something which depends on the on the uh, on the value, All right? So why is it a GOE? It's because this thing is isotropic. So that's what creates this random matrix, right? The end. Of, what is the GOE? You, one way to define it is to say it's a random matrix whose entries are IID symmet real symmetric, and the entries above the diagonal are IID Gaussian centered. Okay. That's one way, but that's uh, not the best way. The best way that GOE is, of course, a, a Gaussian matrix, which is uh, whose distribution is in fact invariant by the orthogonal group. Right. So this is the this invariance that does this, in fact. So uh, so this is a simple computation. Everybody can compute all that. It's just the differentiation. Yeah. Just a very stupid question. To be sure, I understand what you're talking about. When you make the average to say it's the distance on the sphere, the covariance between h sigma and h sigma prime, is the average over j's? Right? Yes, yes. That's so the only. There is only that yeah. randomness. So, here. given instance of the sphere for a given realization of the j's, is a full like all the possibilities of the p-spin for a given set of j. I'm sorry, I don't understand that. <laughs> uh, the sphere is one sphere. There's, there are no instances of the sphere. There's no, yeah, there's one sphere. One sphere. Okay. So you, you draw some... So I have a function. Put it this way. Take the geometric point of view. This is a random function on the sphere. There's nothing else. There's no Gibbs so measure this is in j, yes. So there's a random function on the sphere, which is just random because of the j's. The j's are random. Mm -hmm. And so every time I write expectation or covariance or whatever, it's under this randomness. And the position of the sphere correspond to any configuration of the yes. yeah. You have at once all the possible configurations that you see. I'm sorry, that I don't understand again. When you look at the sphere, if you can watch the sphere, you can watch. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to make a very <laughs> X, this is the spin configuration. This is why I called it, oh, I'm sorry, this X should have been sigma here because I changed the notation. Yeah, okay, I was on the geometry side, it was X. Now on the physics oh, okay, side, it's okay. sigma. Sigma is a spin configuration, of course. And here we're on the spherical spin. So that's. And now you're averaging about the J's. So yes. I'm not averaging here. Oh, yes, I mean, you look at the. Uh, the randomness <laughs> under the randomness of J. Okay? Good. So, so the question finally boils down to computing this expectation of the determinant of a GOE matrix of size n minus 1 minus a constant, let's forget that it depends on v, times the identity, absolute value, and possibly, if you want, indicator of the fact that the index is k. Okay, so that's what we have to compute. Right? That's not that difficult. So first, let's forget the index k. Let's just do it for every index. Okay. So let's let, let's try to do this simple problem. As I said, the difficulty here is the absolute value, which is a little bit of a pain, but not that much. This is, of course, here is a very vague way of uh, doing this quickly. This is exponential n times 1 over n. So, so of course, this is just, uh, let me write one, one more step. It's the product of the lambda i minus from 1 to n minus 1 
minus C absolute value, right? And the lambda i is being the eigenvalues of the GOE. So of course I can write this as expectation of exponential n, one over n, sum of log of the lambda i minus c. I'm sorry, f, maybe I should have n minus one, n minus one, n minus one. Right? I've done nothing yet. Then I can do something. I can say, in fact, we know that the empirical measure of the eigenvalues converges to <coughs> to the semicircle. Right? So this thing maybe I can replace by and then if I so this goes to something deterministic. Right? This thing here converges to the integral of log of lambda minus c d sigma of lambda where the sigma is the semicircle. So then maybe it's true that this is like exponential n, and of course here you can replace n, n minus 1 by n, times this thing. Right? Shouldn't be too hard. In fact, it's not that clear. So first, <coughs> first I said that the, just for future purposes, Let's see how this could be true, and what we what we have uh, taken for granted here. First, when I said that this converges to that, it's not completely clear because the the fact that the empirical measure converges says that when you take any reasonable function, right? The fact that so we know this. So, just as a spoiler, this result is true right? essentially at the logarithmic level. But let me so first we know that the the empirical measure converges to the semicircle. At Wigner's law, this is the simplest thing on, on the GOE. So of course that means that if you integrate this against a, a, a decent function f, this will converge to the integral of f d sigma, which is what I did here. Right? Except that the function here is not decent, it's the log. But the log has a singularity, right, that you have to tame. Let's, in this case, so how could, how could this singularity play a role? Well, this Gaussian case, it won't, but if you have it here, you have a fixed C, which depends on your value V, and then you look at the, the cloud of eigenvalues around it. If you had, by any chance, a kind of clumping of eigenvalue at a scale which is too small, then this log could be a problem. But we know that for this kind of random matrices, this doesn't happen. The eigenvalues are well spread out. So that's the first thing. But then, of course, doing this inside an exponential approximation is really risky. This could converge, but still, the exponential n does not. So in fact, why is that true? I mean, it, there are many reasons, but you can say much more than that. The reason is, of course, that the, in fact, in this convergence, the probability, you have what is called a, I don't know that, the probability, let me write it vaguely first, the probability that this empirical measure, let me call it Ln, probably that Ln is close to a measure mu which would not be sigma, this is very vague, is roughly exponential minus n squared times a function of mu. If mu, and, uh, uh, let's say mu here, and so and this i of mu is a nice, is a convex function of mu. Which has a unique minimum at the semicircle. So this i of mu is, oh, is positive except when you are at the semicircle. So as soon as you take a function of mu, so the empirical measure is close to something else than the, than the semicircle. The probability of that is extremely small. It's exponential minus n squared. This is not a big deal. This is, I will, I will come back to that. So once you know that, of course, you can believe that this is true. Because here I'm looking at something in the scale n. The probability that this is different from this is like exponential minus n squared. 
right? So typically, then this should be true. Agree? I'm in the position of a mathematician trying to convince <coughs> by just moving my hands. Of course, there's a theorem behind this, and the theorem is this is true. So, so the result that you find using this is the fact that this, you can believe that, and it's just, so in fact, what you need, you don't need this n squared. <coughs> What you need is simply that this concentration here, the fact that lambda n concentrate, ln concentrates on the semicircle, the, the scale of concentration has to be faster than n. <coughs> well, if you had something here, anything log faster than n, n to the power of 1 plus epsilon, or n log n, that would be enough. Right? So with this, what you can prove is that the limit of 1 over n <coughs> log of this is, in fact, uh, what we wrote over there. Well, <coughs> okay. So now, the other thing is, of course, you may want to understand what happens now if you, so this is, what does this give you? This thing, remember, if I didn't put the index here, this gives you the total number of critical points below a level. Right? I remember C dependent on the level. So with this very simple computation, if you can make it right, you can compute the total number of critical points below, critical, below a level. Nothing tells you about, this doesn't tell you anything about minima. Right? All critical points, because you didn't fix the index. So what if you want to compute with fixed index? Okay, so first, Maybe I should, before going there, because I will need this, let me make this of a, of a, of a solid statement. So this thing that I use here, and which is, uh, is this is a large, this is in, in, in math language called the large deviation principle for the empirical measure, for the spectral measure. So this is now in mathematical language, the same thing as I was, I was just saying vaguely before. So here, you look at this empirical measure for a, for a GOE. Right? Okay. Lambda i's are the eigenvalues of a GOE, normalized as usual. And so this thing is, in fact, the probability measure, which I call m1 usually, on the real line. But M1 means the measures of whose mass one, the probability. Okay, so this is a probability measure on the real line. Right? It's a random probability measure on the real line. Right? And now, so this is a random element of this guy, of this space. And on this space, I want to say that the law of this thing satisfies a large deviation principle. So I want to look at this. I want to look at the probability that Ln is in a space set A, right, where A now is a subset of all possible probability measures on R, a decent subset, a Borel subset, but we can forget that. And then you want to understand this, how this behaves. And I said this should behave like exponential minus n squared times something, when this A does not contain the semicircle. So the way mathematicians do that, they, they take log, divide n squared, look at lim soup of this, and this will be smaller than minus the infimum of a certain function i of mu from mu in the closure of A. This bar means the topological closure in the space of, of probability measures. And you have the lower bound. This is called the, this is the upper bound of large deviation. And you have the lower bound, which is larger than minus the infimum of the of mu for mu in the interior of A. So in good cases, these two things are the same, and you have the, the uh, uh, the two bounds are the same, so the limit exists. Okay, and this I of mu <coughs> is uh, an obvious thing, it's just the uh, logarithmic energy of this function <coughs> and my 
times a constant. And so, what, so this is this i, and you can check that this i is convex and has a unique minimum at the swim circle, which is zero. Right? So the minimum of this, so this i is non negative, it's a nice function, it's lower, semi continuous, whatever, and it's zero if and only if so the, uh, mu is the semi circle. Right? So this is like a, an action, and it's of course minimized at the semi circle. This is what I used before, essentially. Okay. So this is uh, this large deviation is due, due to Alice, uh, Alice Guillonet and myself a long time ago. Right. So once you have it, what I said before, this becomes clear. But this is kind of overkill. You don't need that much, in fact, as I said. Now, what about? <coughs> What about the computation with a fixed index, which is important for us because we, we want to compute this, the, the number of local minima, and not only the number of all critical points. So how would you do that? So now you have, yes? But we are interested in something about the limit from P, not from log P. What? We're interested in some limiting uh, Large deviation from the probability itself, not from the log. You can also do that, but here you don't need it. Right. For this thing, you don't need it. Because you have expectation. Yeah. The of this log. Yes. So, okay, let me do that. You have exponential before. So let me come back. What I said was obvious. You have exponential n of a certain function of ln, right? Let's forget the index. All right. I write that this is exponential n function of ln minus function of the semicircle mm -hmm. times exponential of n times the function of the semicircle, mm -hmm. right? Now I say the probability that this is larger than anything, epsilon, is exponential minus n squared. Yeah, but that's not what you show. Here. Yeah, that's exactly what I show. Yeah. Okay? If this f is reasonable, that's exactly what this shows. Well, no, no, you can't. This is I mean, if you want. First, the proof is written, but I can go there. So, you you separate this thing into two bits. You write this. So th this is smaller than that times the exponential n f of sigma, plus the exponential of n times this difference, n f of sigma indicator of the set where f of ln minus f of sigma right, is larger than epsilon. You split into two. This is, this is OK, because when you take the limb soup, then, then you can let the epsilon go to 0. And this is smaller than, the, this probability is smaller than exponential minus n squared, which beats this guy. Okay, you have to be prudent, because this thing is not bounded, because there's a log. but. That's what the paper does, of course. So this is a proof. You don't need more than large deviation. In fact, you need less. All right, so let's go back to the case with the index, because that's the important thing here. So how do you do that? So there's a trick, of course. Now again, what you want to do, it, so you run the right expe expectation of the product of lambda i minus c. And index equals k means that you have, uh, let, let me assume that I've ordered my lambda i's. OK? Which I can, of course. And just for the, so now what does that mean? It means that I have k, so this means that lambda k right, is negative 0, and lambda k plus 1 is positive. Okay. That's what the index means. I have k eigenvalues which are negative, and, one which is, uh, and, and the rest which are positive. All right, this is a little complicated. This is too delicate a thing to be uh, attacked by this. But there is a trick which is very simple, and it's the following. 
This, there you use the fact that you know the distribution of the GOE, so you have to integrate this thing, indicator of this, and then you write the law of the GOE, which is lambda i minus lambda j times exponential minus n over 2, the sum of lambda i squared, d lambda. is more than j. Okay. Then the trick is extremely simple. You just say, if I'm on this event here, I, I should, and, and remember, yeah, I, I, I should have said that. This thing here, you will have to integrate. Remember in the original catch rise formula, this c was essentially, up to a constant, the value of the function. Right? The shift was essentially proportional to the value of the function. So in the end, you had to integrate on this value of the function, right? Because you conditioned by h, but then you had to integrate on h. So finally, in front of this, you had something like this with an integral of an exponential minus c squared over 2 dc, something like this. Because you integrate in this value, which was Gaussian. All right, so if you have something like that here, maybe with a different variance, then you see what, you see what to do. You just have to decide that the C, oh, I'm sorry, this was not this. This was smaller than C, larger than C, because it was lambda i minus C that was negative. So you just decide that C could be seen as one more eigenvalue in one more dimension. You go from a fr something on the GOE n minus 1 to a GOE n, because you have the Gaussian term here, which you have here, there too. Here you have this van der Mond determinant, which is always there in the distribution, and this is exactly the term that is missing. So once you do all this, you find the following thing. You find that, so let me give you, oh, let me get you right here. When you use this trick, and this is what is done in this paper, you find this exact formula, which is interesting. The expected number of critical points of index k, fixed k, with that, uh, let's say, I wanted to compute that with below level u, is exactly, there's a constant, and then expectation for a GOE of size n, because now when you add one variable, this is a GOE of size n, of exponential minus n, Right, so here, I've called the eigenvalues of my GOE of size n, lambda 0, lambda n minus 1. So these are the eigenvalue of the GOE of size n. So let's look at this formula. Believe me, you just do what I explain, and then this is what you find. So where is this factor coming from? It's coming from the fact that maybe the integration in c squared doesn't have the same variance in this one. And this is what you get. So look, this is an interesting, fun, uh, interesting thing, because here on this side, you have a really random geometric problem. You want to compute the number of local minima or critical points of index k below a level u <coughs> on a certain Hamiltonian. So this lives in the world of random geometry or zero temperature physics. And this lives in the world of random matrices, purely. Right? This is entirely something about the case eigenvalue of a GOE. Right? And this formula, so these two constants are explicit, no, not important here. This formula is valid for every u, every k, every n, every p. So it's, it's there. It's not an asymptotic formula. Okay? So of course you can use it. So what does this tell you? Now, how can you, using this, how can you compute the complexity? Remember what we want to find is limit of 1 over n log of this thing. Right? That's what we're after. 
So using this, you see that this, is a certain, this limit exists, and it's a certain function, which I will call theta, k, k and p of u. But, and I will describe what this thing is, but how do you do that? In order to do that, what you need here is, here you need a large deviation principle in scale in at speed n for the case eigenvalue. Okay, so you take the case eigenvalue of a GOE. Okay. K is fixed, n goes to infinity here. So I'm talking about edge eigenvalues. Right. With my notations here, lambda 0 is the smallest eigenvalue. Lambda 1 is the second smallest. So if k is 17, you're looking at a 17 second value of a very large matrix, right? And you want to understand how, what these guys do, right? So that's what you need, and this exists. This was done by uh, Amir Dembo, Alice Guillonet and myself, and then extended in the paper of, uh, a long time ago, in fact, for about 2003 or whatever. And that was already a story about spin glasses that was behind this thing. But so what is this? So this large deviation, yeah? No, that was not a question. <laughs> this large deviation principle says the following. So the law, the distribution of the, so this is a theorem, which is the distribution of the case eigenvalue for a GOE satisfies the large deviation principle at speed n, not n squared, which means, again, the limit soup of 1 over n now, not n squared. Logarithm of probability of lambda k is in a set a is smaller than a minus nth, that I should call j now, of, over of x, let's say, when x is in a bar, and same thing for the lower bound. This is, in fact, very simple. This is not a deep theorem. And this j is explicit. And where is this j minimum? So it's important to note, so we are looking now at the large deviation of well, the case eigenvalue. So let's look at the, the, the first eigenvalue with my notation that was k equals 0. Okay. So what's the story? You have the semicircle, okay, minus 2, 2. And we are looking at the smallest eigen. So we know that the empirical measure, the spectral measure, converges to that. If you draw the histogram, it would be very close to the semicircle. But now I'm looking at, let's say, which, this is the case important for the local minima. k equals 0 corresponds to minima. So the local minima corresponds to looking at the smallest eigenvalue. And so we know that the smallest eigenvalue will be somewhere here. <coughs> we'll, we know that it will converge to, minus, to converge to negative 2, the bottom of the semicircle. We also know the order of magnitude of this thing, the typical fluctuation that is given by the Tracy Wooden dis distribution. But here I'm asking, what is the probability? So the typical value of lambda 0 should be negative 2. Right. So large deviation is, what is the probability that lambda 0 is here or that lambda 0 is here? Right. So these two answers are very different. What is the probability that lambda 0 is here? What order of magnitude is that? Hmm? N squared. Because if the smallest eigenvalue is here, it means that you have moved the whole distribution away above this. So it means, so the probability that lambda 0, let's say, is larger than negative 2 plus eta, and eta is positive, right? this should behave logarithmically like exponential minus n squared times a certain function of eta. 
because you just apply the large deviation principle I gave you before for the bulk, right? Because moving the smallest eigenvalue right to the right means moving the bulk, right? So this tells you that this j, necessarily this j of x, is plus infinity in this scale when x is larger than negative 2. Okay? Because otherwise this would not mean anything. But then, what this says is that what is the probability that lambda 0, let's say, is smaller than negative 2 minus eta, where eta is positive, this one. Okay? This now is more probable. It's like exponential minus n times a certain function of another function of eta, okay, which is positive now, which is this j. So the probability to move an eigenvalue here is exponential minus n times something, whereas the probability to move it on this side is exponential minus n squared. Right? So moving one eigenvalue here is expensive. It's exponential minus n, but it's not terribly expensive. Right? This is what this theorem tells you. What about looking at k equal 1? So now you're looking at the second eigenvalue. Moving the second eigenvalue here is again something exponential minus n squared, because you have to move the bulk. Moving the second eigenvalue here means you also move, have to move the first eigenvalue. Right? And you would see that, in fact, the, the, the optimal strategy, if you want to move the second eigenvalue here, is to move the, the two eigenvalue here, lambda 0 and lambda 1. This is the least expensive you can do. Because, of course, you could move lambda 0 more to the left, but this would be more expensive, right? So this very intuitive reasoning say that this function, which I should call jk, in fact, this jk is k times j1. But there's also a repulsion term between the, the two eigenvalues, right? Yeah, but, but this is still, at the scale, this is what the best thing to do. Okay, so this JK scales linearly with K. That's what we have. Okay, so this is a fact. When you use this fact and you look at this, now look, this is a large deviation fun problem for lambda K. This is exponential N, a function of lambda K. Okay. And then indicator of lambda K in a certain set. So you know what this function theta K P should be. So you see this dictionary that I mentioned before works here at full speed between large deviation questions for random matrices and this complexity computation. This theta k should be the infimum of uh, our function minus whatever it is, p minus two. Uh, I put a negative here, so it will be a super one of uh, negative p minus 2 over 2p, let's say x squared, plus the large deviation function jk of x minus on x, which is this u here, x smaller than cp prime of u. Essentially, that's what this large deviation analysis will tell you. So you have to solve a variational problem on a certain set, which depends on the value u. And with all this, you find what this theta kp of is, and it's not a very complicated thing. And once I can give you the formula, which is moderately interesting. It's 1 half of log of p minus 1. minus p minus 2 over 4p minus 1 u square minus k plus 1 phi of u over e infinity where e infinity is 2 square root of p minus 1 over p and where phi of v is 2 integral from v to 1 or square root of v square minus 4 
or v to two, I'm sorry, uh, dv, and there's the two, with this normalization. Okay, anyway, that's a function, a very easy function. And what, okay, so now we have this complexity computation. And then we have to examine what it says. <coughs> so here's what it says. How is, oh, th I'm sorry, this is for you, uh, this was for you smaller than negative e infinity. And for you larger, It's just the first terms. So let me draw a graph of these functions, and then you will see what they, what they tell you about complexity. And then we'll go to the case with a signal. Remember, this is still the case with signal-to-noise ratio equals 0. Spin glass model. So here is the, what this function do. <coughs> So here I put u, and you have a, th a threshold negative e infinity here, above which this function is constant. That's what we say here. And note that this function here does not depend on k. So for every k, it's the same value. And then, so here I'm drawing what theta 0 is. It's something like this. And this is theta 1, and then theta 2, that's it. <coughs> so this tells us, so this will vanish at a point that we call negative e0, this one negative e1, this one negative e2, etc. So what does this say? <coughs> Remember, this gives us the logarithmic asymptotics of the total number of critical points of index k below the level n u. Right? So this says that at least above this number, this mean number is exponentially large. Right? Because this complexity is positive. So first it tells you that you have an exponentially large number of local minima. It also says that above this level, this is flat. Remember, it was cumulative. So it means, in fact, it's a region where you no longer have any local minima. Right? The cumulative number stops increasing. So all the local minima are between this number. Remember, you had to multiply it by n. So all local, you have exponentially many local minima. between negative n e0, roughly, and negative n infinity. So this says something. Remember, the value 0 is the typical value of the energies. The typical point is at value 0. The fluctuations are typically square root n. And all the local minima are, in fact, very low. They are below this level. <coughs> So around typical points, you don't have local minima. They are pretty low. They are below the threshold, which, uh, whose value is written over there. In this region here, and above this, above this threshold, you have no local minima, but you have no critical points of finite index. Of index 1, 2, 3, 4, this doesn't happen. Right? They are, they're all stable here. Of course, above this level, which is very low, you have plenty of critical points but of an index that is diverging with n. Right? So the number of directions going down will be essentially a fraction of n. If you take a typical point, a, tip, a critical point which is a typical value 0, it will have essentially n over 2, index n over 2, n over 2 directions going down, n over 2 directions going up. And when you go down, this index stays a fraction of n. All that can be proven. It's more complicated than what I'm saying here, but it's done in the papers. And when you go down, this fraction goes down until you get to the threshold where this fraction becomes uh, disappears, and then the index now becomes finite here okay, in this region. One more thing is that in this region where you have local minima, they dominate exponentially all the other critical points. 
right? This is the complexity of several points of index 1. And you have exponentially many less than theta 0, right? Because this curve is below that curve. Yeah? These results are expectation over all yeah. Yeah, so, of course, so join is, it, what I'm saying here is just for the expectation. It's the first moment. So everything I'm saying here is not really correct, right? Because it's just the first moment. I need to do something more to control that. So I'll come to that in a moment. But just at least at the de level of the first moment, this annealed computation, if you want, this is strictly larger than that, which is strictly larger than that, etc. Okay? So at least it indicates that maybe the local minima are more uh, dominate. All right, so then, so this gives you this picture of, you know, if you accept it like this, and there's more to say, that if you start from a critical point, the, the saddle point that you can find are essentially, uh, you know, with a macroscopic index, an index diverging with n. Then when you go low enough, you will find local minima below the threshold. Okay? So now to come back to John's question, this is just, but of course, I don't want to spend too much time on that because, okay, the important thing here is that all that is at very low level of energy. And this, is, this will not be, at the time to get there, if you look at the dynamics here, really low here will be exponentially large in n. So for any algorithm, this is totally useless information. Um, it's useful to know that it's exponentially large in n, but you don't run an algorithm in time exponential n. So what we'll be really interested in are what happens for short time, this is what I mentioned before, and this, is, this will happen way above this. Okay? So, just to answer quickly the question of John. So that was the first moment. You can now, of course, if you want to understand really more than that, you can look at the second moment computation. Right, so you can compute the expectation of this number of, of critical points squared. Okay. So how do you do that? I, I won't do that because I won't spend too much time. I want to answer the question. So you can apply. There is a catch rise formula for this, and it involves now instead of having one Hessian, one point, one critical point, and it's Hessian. You, ha you, now, you now have two critical points, and they're Hessian. Right? So in order to solve this second moment thing, to compute it, what you have to understand is the joint distribution of two Hessians at two critical points. Right? In this case, the two Hessians are both GOEs shifted. So you, you now have two G shifted GOEs. But they are correlated. Right? Because this field is very correlated. Right? So you have to beat this correlation. The correlation is a, is a, is a, short, is a small rank correlation. So you, you can work hard and do that. And this was done in a PhD thesis of Eliran Subag in 15 or something, or 16. And then with, with this second moment computation, Eliran proved that when u is small enough, so where you're at low energy, let's say an energy around here, then the second moment behaves like the square of the first moment. And so in the end, the first moment computation is relevant. Right? And you can prove that the number of critical points for u low enough divided by its mean goes to 1. So the first moment computation gives you the right answer. This is a deep result, in fact. This is for u small enough, low enough. So what does this say? In fact, this gives, a, a, and it's probably valid, I won't go there, but it's probably valid until the, uh, the static phase transition. But what does this give you? Very, very uh, clearly an alternative to the replica trick or to the Paris division of this. It's just a purely geometric description. Of it. From this you can get, and it has been done, by Subag himself and by Subag and Zaytuni, and then by Subag, Zaytuni, and myself. So there are one paper by Subag himself, one with Subag and Zaytuni, one with the three of us, where you can, in fact, using this information and this second moment computation, com 
control completely the structure of the Gibbs measure. So let me just, we are not talking Gibbs measure here, I'm talking zero temperature, but just give me two minutes of that, I think I can do that here. What is the picture? Uh, it says the following. And there is, there's an even more recent paper by Subai, which is online, which is absolutely wonderful. So let me put the energy this way. You have here the energy zero, which is the typical energy. The negative square root n is the, the level of the fluctuation. Then, the, then here you have the threshold. And here the negative e zero n. So first here, let's go back to this. This guy here, where the complexity vanishes, it's clear that just by a, mo a simple inequality, the probability to find a critical point below this is exponentially small. Right? But the probability to find one below this is smaller than the mean, and the mean is exponentially small. Right? So this guy should be smaller than the ground state. But of course, you suspect that it is the ground state. But with the first moment computation, you can't prove it. So you can prove that E0 is the ground state two ways. And our first paper, what we do is we compute an E0 through this method. You have the function theta. You can look at where it vanishes. It's not hard. And then you compute the ground state. Right? Just because in, you know that at low temperature, the P spin is the one step, one RSB. So you can solve the Parisi uh, variational formula, which is proven mathematically to be rigorous. And then you can, from there, compute the free energy, let the temperature go to zero, find the ground state. And lo and behold, they are the same. So you're happy. All right. Careful. I can hear here some uh, vibes that are, because it always happens, and, uh, those mathematicians. Of course it will be the same. In fact, no. If you do the same thing for a mixture of p-spins, I can give you somewhere this thing will not be true. Right? The ground state will be strictly above the threshold of annual complexity. Natural. If you think that. So here they are the same. And then, but then you can prove. So, but in order to do that, I had to use Parisi's approach. But in fact, if you use the second moment method, you don't need to do that. You can prove directly that the ground state is this. And then you can prove that above this, so this is the ground state. Then, of course, obviously, if you take a level of energy here, this corresponds to a temperature, a low temperature. You may want to describe the Gibbs measure. This is what is done by Subag and Vitunia. And what you find is very simple. You look at the deepest states, which are very close to this ground state. They fluctuate a little bit. You look at the, the basic, you know, they are the wells that they define. And then, of course, at this level of energy, they will, you would have here a level level set, which is essentially an n minus 2 sphere. And the Gibbs measure is essentially consecrated on these guys, which is, of course, what the 1 RSV picture tells you. And on this, on this things, the, this, is, this behaves like a two-spin spherical at high temperature. So it's a very simple thing. OK, so you would describe the Gibbs measure like this. That's for the pure p-spin. And in particular, in the work of Johan, that's I'm going that deep because of Johan, but this proves, for instance, that you have no chaos in temperature. This proves that, in fact, interestingly, the Gibbs, the Gibbs measure is concentrated on the deepest states. That's not that clear, because at this level, you know, take this level here. Take a point here. You could look at this state, this well. Why, and you prove that this well does not contribute. All the Gibbs measure is concentrated on the deepest one. And so, because it's like that, you see that you have no chaos in temperature. When you choose, change the temperature at low temperature, you see these things moving up and down. So they're all centered on the same guys. Right? So this, there's no chaos in temperature. The Gibbs measure at a given temperature and the Gibbs measure at a slightly different temperature have something in common. They live in the same thing. This is for pure p-spin. And the last paper, with, which is also online, with Ofer, Zetouni, and Eliran Subag, and myself, we prove that when you take mixtures, then you have chaos in temperature. And the structure, this structure of the Gibbs measure is not true. If you raise the temperature, this will win over this. Right, so this is a delicate thing. But this is totally irrelevant for what you want to do, because this is very low temperature. Before you get there, you have to cross so, much, so many energy barriers 
that your Langevin dynamics or gradient dynamics will, uh, you know, you will be dead by then if you simulate. So that's not what we want to do. Okay. P equals two is not is not possible. I'm sorry. P equals two. P equal two is trivial. <coughs> I'm sorry. I think it's chaotic. The temperature is chaotic. Yeah, P equal two. Of course, the. So first, by the way, look at the formula I just erased. <laughs> <laughs> and the exponent, just to answer Hein, in the exponent you had a P minus two. Right? So when people do, this exponential just goes away. And you just go look at the probability that an eigenvalue is in some set. So you forget, you, you lose this exponential complexity, of course, because p equal 2, you are looking at a quadratic form on the sphere. So the critical points are just the eigenvectors, plus and minus. So this is not hard. It's not a complex thing. All right. So that was for lambda equals 0. Sorry, but this is valid uh, when temperature is around 0. Very low, yeah. yeah. No, this is valid. This is absolutely valid. The, for the moment, it's proven in a range of temperature which is fixed. Yeah. Uh, it's just a matter of us being lazy. In fact, this should be valid until the critical temperature. Sorry. Uh, the static critical temperature. Exactly. Yes. So as soon as you. Yeah. Okay. So now, now that to that answer Chiara, I have to do something else. So here you have the, come on, this is not supposed to be a physics school. <laughs> so here you have all this multiplication, exponentially many local wells. And to each level here corresponds a temperature. This is not the critical temperature, the static critical temperature. The static critical temperature is, will be at this energy. Right? And so in all this regime, the, the, local, the, 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 the Gibbs measure is dominated by the deepest wells. When you get here, you get in this, uh, I learned the word from you, so you should, or, and, and Julio. In this phase here, the scattered phase, in, in, or the spindle phase, whatever, and for temperatures here, you are at high temperature, so the, 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 the Gibbs measure is replica symmetric, but in fact it's scattered, because it's, it's made of ex exponentially many of these little things, and so, of course, when you take two of them, they will typically be in two different ones, mm -hmm. and two different ones will typically be orthogonal on the sphere. So the overlap will be zero. So it's, it's, it, it, this is a, a, a replica symmetric thing, but with, which is very different from a uh, you know, paramagnetic phase, very high up. In right? So this, this is there. Yeah, OK. So the band below is populated by a non-exponential number of minima. Yes. Okay. No, you have many, many more. But they don't contribute to the Gibbs measure here. These ones contribute to the Gibbs measure at those temperatures. You could have something like this. Right? This one would correspond to, may contribute yeah. to something here. And this one, the one that are the highest here, create wells which go above the threshold and which you can feel in, in the dynamics when you come from above. But not in the statics. All right, so. Let's go back now to the tensor, PCA. So same question now. With a signal to noise ratio for the tensor PCA. So remember what our function was. It was the same function. The noise was the spherical spin glass. But on top of it, we had added if I decided that my unknown tensor V was the North Pole here, E1, <coughs> we had added lambda V scalar U to the, to the power P. So here it will be simply lambda U1 to the P with the proper normalization. Right? So you add this to your spherical equivalence. OK, so when lambda equals 0, it's the same model. When lambda increases, this may begin playing a role. So for the moment, I'm not looking at the dynamics or anything. I'm just looking at the complexity as a random function. Right? 
So you can see if lambda is huge, it's clear that the so here you're creating a very deep well that will, in the end, uh, flatten everything else in some sense. But when lambda is not lo that large, you have a coexistence of these two things. So I explain what happens. So let me remind you what happens in, in words. You have two transitions, a lambda 1 and a lambda 2. You can call lambda c and lambda s. But when lambda is smaller than lambda 1 in the right units, and I don't come back to the units, Everything behaves like, so first, when lambda equals zero, this equator here, uh, on the equator, the model is exactly the spin glass. Right? So you have all the complexity, I would say, you have it here. The whole picture that I was describing, you have it here. But then when lambda increases a little bit, then you will have simply a, an exponentially large number of local minima on a band around the equator. And this band gradually increases. It's not, so this dispersion here is not really relevant. It's just noise because, in fact, the, 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 the deepest points are at the equator right, in this band. You have exponentially many, but the deepest are at the equator, which means, remember, you're doing, trying to do maximum likelihood with a negative sign always. I don't know how to match physics and statistics otherwise. So you have this... Uh, the maximum likelihood will end up, if you could find the, the, the maximum here, it will be on the equator, which is ex exactly zero, zero signal to noise, zero correlation with the signal. So maximum likelihood fails horribly. Right? Of course, if, the, if the, the, the global minimum was on the edge here, that would be good news, because then you would have at least a little bit of correlation with the signal. But you don't. Right? The absolute minimum is on the equator. Right? And so this grows until a certain value of lambda 1, where something, so, something <coughs> appears at a positive latitude. And on this positive latitude, you will have exponential, uh, sub-exponentially many uh, critical points and local minima. So this sounds like a good thing, because this one is really correlated with that. But again, this one is, in fact, not the global minimum at this transition. And then at a larger lambda, this thing is, so this thing moves up. And at a larger lambda, this one becomes the global minimum. <coughs> so at, above this larger lambda, which I call lambda 2 last time, or the time before, above this larger lambda, maximum likelihood, if you can perform it algorithmically, which you can't, but if you could, uh, uh, maximum likelihood would give you a positive correlation with the signal. Would work, right? So that would be weak recovery, <laughs> All right? And then the more, you, and then when you let lambda go to infinity in those units, this thing <coughs> times up to, to here, so you get strong recovery, right? Because if you find the place where the maximum likelihood is achieved, it will be closer and closer to the signal, All right? So that's what this complexity thing says. And again, so there was a lambda 1 and there was a lambda 2. And at this lambda 2, so I told you what happened here, what happens here. At this lambda 2, where weak recovery uh, begins, uh, this is, in fact, this can be checked to be so the moment where you can recover something with the maximum likelihood is, in fact, the same as for the IT threshold, which is a deeper thing. In some sense, it's, and this is a mirror, uh, this is something I don't understand. I mean, I, I do see it, but, so below this level, you can't <coughs> do anything. Okay? Even though it seems tempting to say, I have this thing here, but you cannot exploit it. All right, so how do you do this computation of complexity before going into all this? So I will first explain the anneal complexity. So we want to do the same thing. Expectation of, let's say, crit. So we're a bit lazy. In this. So now I'm describing what is done in the paper with Andrea Montanari and, uh, and Sang Mei and Mihai Nika. So 
we computed the number of critical points and the total and the number of local minima. And if somebody wants to compute the number of critical points of index k, it can be done. But, but we computed it in a little dip in order to see the picture here. We computed this. Let's say crit zero in the number of local minima, critical points of index k. M and E, that's our annotations. So let me explain what that is. This means the number of critical points whose latitude is in M and whose values is in E. All right? So this is the number of local minima X such that X in a product was X, so such that X1 the first coordinate is in M, and that f of x is in E. So that's the kind of information we need, because then, we, then with this we can understand the local minima at a given latitude and at a given depth. That's the two things I was describing. All right? And so we compute the number of local minima and the total number of critical points. And what we find is something very similar. And so this time, I will not let Joanne tell me, but this is only the first moment. Because in fact, there is the other paper about this, the, the, other, the, you know, the distribution. This is the paper with uh, Giulio, Chiara, and Valentina, where the, 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 the quench result is given, but uh, not using a, really a, a brutal second moment, but uh, replicated cat rights, so not 100% kosher, at least for me. Um, but certainly true because, as we discussed before, this is uh, this replica thing is happening in a replica symmetric thing. So it should, if somebody is courageous enough, this this paper is, is certainly correct. But for the moment, this one is uh, okay. That's, that's just for Jorge to tease him a little bit. So this one is what if you ever heard Talagrand speaking, you know, the, the mathematician who proved many of the results about spin glasses rigorously in huge books. So when he had this question of, is this rigorous, not rigorous? So he had invented this uh, thing, which would please, I think, Jorge. He called them cramp. Like, you know, mathematic, mathematician is cramp. So cramp, it was completely rigorous, absolutely mathematically proven. It was a way to say, okay, <laughs> Dead. So this one is cramp. The one with Valentina and Giulio and Chiara is not yet cramp. Can I just make a small thesis comment about? No, but this is a mean field inversion also of a glass that has a crystalline phase. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. If you mean this one yeah. uh, with with this guy? That's a crystal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it's nice to think it that way too. We've discovered, in fact, later that. That there was a, an old paper by was it Sherrington uh, himself, which uh, which we had uh, no idea. But you know, now my view is that every time you search for something in this literature, it's there. But uh, uh, so so yes. But, so let's so let me come back to how the result first. So the result is of the same type. So but of course I don't I can't really. So you have the limb soup of 1 over n, as before. Not consistent with notation, limb soup. 1 over n log of the mean number of critical points in a set m and e. This is bounded above by the infimum of a certain function, s of m and x, for m in m bar and x in e bar. And you have the limb inf with the same thing, a certain function. M in the interior, X in the interior, and here you have the limit of the same thing. All right, so this gives you this com exponential complexity if you can know what the function S is. And the function S is a big mess. So bear with me. S of M and X is one half of log of P plus minus one plus one, if I'm not mistaken, plus one half of log of one minus M square. 
minus minus p lambda square m to the 2p minus 2 1 minus m square minus x minus lambda m to the p square plus a certain function phi of square root of 2p you recognize this guy I guess p minus 1 x and this phi is x squared over 4 minus 1 half and it's x squared over 4 minus 1 half minus x over 4 square root of x squared minus 4 plus log of square root of x squared minus 4 over 4 minus 1 plus x over 2 this is when x is smaller than 2 and the support of the semicircle and this is when x is larger than 2 okay so not very instructive big formula but very explicit and so you have a function here where you have the signal to noise ratio where you have the latitude m and when you have the value x okay all this is mixed in the terrible formula right but at least you can compute so if you go to the paper you will see with all sorts of graphs to see how this works there is much more information than the one i gave you but in particular there is the information i gave you right about this band this thing happening and then the, uh, the global minimum. It's hidden in this formula. All right, the question is how do you get it? This is, uh, so you see, this gives you the, really this, the, this mean number is essentially exponential minus n times the infimum of this function s on m and d. So you have to be able then to minimize this thing. So you will see a lot, also lots of pictures that should say how this works. Yeah? So with the quench calculation, you get the same rate function, or what's the, what's the difference? No, it, the, the, the quench rate function cannot be the same everywhere. Right? What I was explaining before on the pure P spin is it's the, the, the quench and the yield are the same very low. I don't believe at all that they are the same, let's say, around the bulk. No, that's, that shouldn't be true. Either. So... So let me, so here you have one more parameter. So depending on lambda, the region where these two things are the same is probably, uh, I mean, depends on lambda. And, and don't push me there, that, there I don't know. All right, so how do you do that? And so you have the same, that was for the total number, and you have the same thing for the minima with a different function as zero, which is a variant of this. But I won't write, I won't annoy you with that. So let me explain how you do, uh, the, uh, how you do this. So in order to do that, of course, you apply cat's rice again. Right? So applying cat's rice is kind of similar. You would have something like that, an integration on the level, but you also have something different now. Because now our, fun our Gaussian field has the same covariance as before, but has a mean. The mean is given by the signal. So what I call, I think, phi or something, the density, you need the density, right? The density of this Gaussian thing will, of course, depend on the point, and it will no, no longer now be something constant on the sphere, of course, because the pole plays a role. So you really have to integrate on the sphere radially, on these on this little... Um, parallels, right? So it's a little more complex. But for a fixed parallel, a fixed latitude, right, you will have something of that nature to compute. Except, remember, the distribution here of, it's easy to, to, to check, what is the distribution of the Hessian of my function, whatever it was, uh, given the fact that the function was, the point was critical, then f of x was whatever v, I have too many, like a V, whatever. So before that was that was this. There was a GOE shifted. Now it's a GOE. Again, why GOE? Because again, you have the isotropy of the noise part. That's why you have the GOE. And then you you still have the shift, the C V times identity. That's still there. But on top of that, you have a rank one perturbation of this, which will be something like a a constant. I don't know <coughs> D times. Uh, E1, E1 transpose. Okay. 
So you have your GOE, the shift does nothing much to the spectrum, of course, it just shifts the spectrum, but you have a rank one perturbation. So remember, last time, I described the BBP transition. So remember what, what happened for this random matrix. So now when I apply this dictionary, I have to understand this random matrix, but in more detail than for the BBP case. Because here, remember what the BBP transition told us. It said that, so you have the semicircle, right? Okay, now I'm looking at the right rather than the left because of the way I wrote it, but it's the same thing. And when, so this was two, and when your perturbation here, D, was too small, the top eigenvalue would stay in the bulk and you would see nothing. When this perturbation would be larger than one, you would see something here at D plus one over D or something like that in the right normalization. Right? Here I did, I forgot this uh, shift. Let's forget the shift, it plays no big role. Right? So you had this transition where the eigenvalue, the top eigenvalue, the same could happen for the bottom one, of course, would get out of the bulk. Right? So below a certain threshold, it would not. Above it would. And you can understand all there the fluctuations and all that. But that's not enough here, because remember, we have to compute this thing, which is in an exponential scale. So suddenly, if you do the same as I did before, this exponential n, 1 over n, sum of log, you need to understand the contribution of this spike here in the exponential scale. Right? So what you need to understand is, in fact, what you need here is a large deviation principle for the top eigenvalue, let's say. Of course, for what we do, it will be the bottom, but forget that. For the top eigenvalue of this spike GOE. All right, so again, forget this, because this does nothing but shifting everybody. Here you, ha you have a GOE spike like this. And now you want to understand the large deviation of the top eigenvalue. Right? So typically, when you're above the threshold, this top eigenvalue should be here. When is the probability that it is here or there? Right? That's what you have to compute. And this is understood. This was done by Milan Maida. I don't know, but a long time ago. 2006 or seven or something like that. So you have it, you use it, you put it in, and you get the formula I give you. Okay. So let me give you now, um, just believe me, this is a long story. It's, it's the only thing you need. What is remarkable here that you need, in the end, this whole thing is just the BBP transition, but in the, in the large deviation regime, this is what creates this big mess at this point. OK, so let me, uh, so Julio, is that the moment? Well, I, mean, it's it's an hour or five minutes. five minutes. OK, so let me just say a, a bit more. So this is, so if you, all that is in the paper. If you believe me, then we can compute this complexity for local minima, for critical points. This annealed complexity. And again, it was just Katz Rice which brought us to this uh, um, BBP transition in the large deviation regime. So all that was there essentially. Now, the you may want so now just for future purposes, let me come back to the case where where instead of having so this was for the P tensor, but now instead of looking at this uh, maximum likelihood function. I look at a more general model, which will be useful later. Now I, I keep my spin glass model, my normalized properly. That's my noise. That's a P spin. And I add to it. Now, instead of having adding x1 to the p, I add x1 to the k. Okay, so this I will call the p plus k now. <coughs> and everything normalized properly.
So you see here, so this is treated for the static here, this is for this complexity, this you find in the paper with uh, Valentina and uh, Chiara, Giulio, and myself. So this is a more, so of course, when k equals p, this is the, 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 the tensor PCA. When k is not p, this doesn't come, obviously, from a, a question of statistics. It's not the maximum likelihood of something. But it's an interesting random function. Right? The interesting part, of course, is that if you have k, you see that when k equals 1 or k equals 2 or k larger than 3, these are different regimes. Right? Why? Because, remember, so when k equals 1, the gradient of this guy cannot be zero. The derivative of this at x1, where, when k equals 2, the derivative can be zero, but the second derivative is not. And when k equals 3, the first and second derivative are zero. Right? So remember, the case we had before, the case before was p equal k larger than 3. Right? That's what we're treating. But now you have all these other things. And this is, of course, already important at the level of complexity. But this says something about the Hessian and the gradient at the equator, which is the important point, because that's where the, the whole entropy is. And this, as, as I mentioned in the first lecture, this will also be very important for the dynamics. Because, of course, when k equals 1, when you're on the equator, you have a stronger drift away from the equator than when k equals 2 or when k equals 3. And the, this huge gap that I will come back to between the algorithm and the weak recovery in the tensor PCA case is not due to the complexity on the equator. It is due to the weakness in the signal where, in the region where the entropy is maximum. That's the important fact. And we will see that when k equals 2 or a little less than 2, 2 is critical. Uh, then this gap is no longer divergent. Okay, so we'll look at that. So for this case, you can look at the complexity okay. of the number of critical points, of local minima or critical points. So this is done in this paper, and the picture is much richer. So you have first this case, that case, and inside this case, you also have subcases, like p larger than k or smaller than k. And you will see, so, Okay, maybe next time I will show you, because it's too complicated to explain everything, I will show you the very beautiful pictures of spheres with bands that you can get. Right? So in, in this case, in one of these cases, at least for instance, you can get the following picture, which I like. So you will have as before, so the, the signal, the unknown signal will be here. As before, around the equator, you will have a band of local minima or, or critical points. But in one regime, you will have another band, which will be like this where you have now exponentially many local minima, not like when k equals p. So, and you will have the same kind of picture where here you have exponentially many, right? And, um, and, and of course, at some point, these are lower than these. You have the same story. Typically, of course, here, once you have managed to escape the equator in this regime, then you won't get there, of course. You will get stopped here. And um, so the difference with the case before, that before we never had this coexistence of two regions with exponentially many. Now you have exponential complexity, not only at the equator, where the signal is essentially not important, but also here, closer to the signal. So let's understand what this means. Again, look at it from the point of view of geometry. You should not see it as a sphere. We're in a very high dimension. Again, you have these two hemispheres. And say so you cut a little band. You have the two hemispheres, which are like the two basins of attraction. Let's assume that P is even so that. And the rest, this little band, is in fact most of the space. It's a, so if you think of it as on the plane, because that's the only thing I can think of, then it's, because if I want to do a graph, I need one more dimension. So I can stay only in dimension two. So this landscape should be seen as you have this plane, which is essentially enormous and completely flat with a little bit of attraction because you have the signal bringing you here. And you have these two basins, right, which are tiny. 
are absolutely tiny that you cannot find easily. You just wander around and you never find them, Ex except the fact that you have this signal bringing you there a little bit. And what this says is that now inside these two tiny basins of attractions, you have this exponential complexity, this ruggedness of the landscape, right? Before going to the bottom, right? Which before we didn't really have. We didn't have exponential, exponential complexity. So this picture is richer and more interesting. It, I, I don't yet, I'm sure if we think we can find something, but we don't have any artificial way to pretend that it's coming from directly from statistics, but it's a nice function to try to understand, okay? So next time I'll go, uh, I'll, I'll probably won't present too many results of that, just pictures, and then we'll try to go to understand uh, dynamics of these things, and then later I will go to more general model than these things. So that was for what case, or where k is not really p, or? No, this is, uh, this is for uh, k equal one or two, I forgot. Uh, I had to get this one. Then you have this yeah, yeah, but, but still k not larger than k. Okay, anyway, you will see. No, I'll show you the pictures. <laughs> no, it's a zoo, of course. You have a million cases. So. cannot come, at least can come uh, today because of a severe back pain. So there won't be any seminar by Ricardo Zekina, but there will be a seminar actually. Johan Bruna that is here with us uh, accepted very kindly because I asked